Welcome to Venable. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum. I'm the chair of the nonprofit organization's practice here at the Venable Law Firm, and welcome to our program today entitled, As Nonprofits Expand Their Global Reach, a special focus on tax trademarks and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That's a mouthful to say, and it's a mouthful of information that, uh, that our speakers have for you uh, this afternoon. Welcome to those of you here in our D.C. office, and we have about 150 folks gathered on the webinar around the country today uh, joining us for today's program. As many of you know, this is part of uh, our monthly series uh, going into our third year now uh, on nonprofit legal topics that we do every month uh, here in D.C. And, and broadcast around the country. Uh, many of you are repeat attendees uh, many, many times, uh, dozens of times in some cases, and uh, some of you are new to the programs, but uh, we hope you enjoy and, and get a lot out of these programs. Um, actually, while I'm on the topic, let, let me just preview uh, our next two upcoming programs that we already have scheduled. On June 25th, our program is going to be entitled Employee Leaves of Absence and Other Employee Accommodations Under the Law, What Every Nonprofit Needs to Know. Uh, based on the uh, very rapid registration response we got, I think we got about 250 people that signed up within the first 24 hours for this, uh, granted a lot on the webinar, uh, but that's going to be a very popular program. It's a very hot topic. As you all know, very complicated topic, and uh, uh, looking forward to a great program that a couple of my colleagues and I will be presenting on June 25th, and then on July 23rd, Another very hot topic, evaluating your nonprofit's options under the Affordable Care Act, the pros and cons of health insurance alternatives for your employees and members. The uh, title kind of speaks for itself. It's going to be a combination of uh, Venable folks and, uh, and a terrific uh, 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 someone from the outside from uh, the Clifton Larson Allen firm, um, and I think it's going to be a really terrific program in July. Um, as you know, uh, for those of you who have come to many of these before, uh, our, um, our, our speakers who I'll introduce here in a moment uh, are going to be uh, covering the topic. I'll be moderating. We will take questions from those of you here in the room at the end of each of their distinct presentations. Uh, we'll have about five or ten minutes for questions at the end of each of their remarks, so save your questions till those times and then uh, pose those. For those of you on the webinar, send your questions through the chat feature. I'll be monitoring the laptop at the front of the room, and we'll pose uh, those questions to our speakers at the appropriate times. Um, you have a full, um, uh, the full PowerPoint presentation uh, deck in your handouts for those of you here in the room in the printed books. Uh, those of you on the webinar should have had it emailed to you. Um, obviously, feel free to follow along. Full bios for our speakers are in your handout materials. I'm not going to go through those bios, in, bios in, in any kind of detail today because we don't have time, but, but definitely take a look at those. Um, tomorrow, all of you will receive an email with a link to the recording from today's program along with the streaming PowerPoint presentation. Uh, feel free to share that with colleagues and others who may benefit from that. All of those get posted uh, on our website, as you know, under uh, venable.com slash nonprofit slash recordings. Um, and for those of you looking for additional resources on the topics we're going to cover today and many others, you can find all of our nonprofit legal resources at venable.com slash nonprofit slash publications. Uh, those links can be found on the last slide of uh, today's PowerPoint presentation. Uh, uh, joining us here today are uh, uh, three of my colleagues, uh, two of whom I've worked with for many, many years in my 14 years here at Venable, uh, one of whom I've uh, only had the privilege of working with more recently. They're all absolutely terrific. To my immediate right is Andrew Price. Uh, Andrew is a phenomenal trademark lawyer who works with many of you I know here in the room and, and hundreds of our nonprofit clients each year in terms of uh, protecting um, and licensing and doing lots of other important and interesting things when it comes to their trademarks. Uh, he's really uh, not only an expert in trademark law, but also how it applies to nonprofits. Andrew's also developed uh, quite an expertise and a lot of experience in recent years in working with our U.S.-based nonprofits and helping them protect their trademarks overseas, which is obviously the focus of today's program. Uh, to Andrew's right is Lindsay Meyer. Uh, Lindsay is uh, the head of Venable's International Trade Practice and also co-managing partner of our law firm. Uh, I've had the uh, uh, distinct privilege of working with Lindsay for, for many, many years uh, in the international trade area uh, when it comes to nonprofit uh, operations overseas. Uh, Lindsay and her colleagues in our group are, are just terrific. Those of you who have worked with them uh, know that. Uh, she's got some terrific insights today. She's going to be focusing on the foreign corrupt practices and other anti-corruption statutes uh, that have relevance for nonprofits that are doing business and conducting activities overseas. And finally, to Lindsay's right is Charles Kolstad. Charles flew in to join us from our LA office. Um, uh, Charles uh, has, has quickly become a, um, uh, a gem here that we, we discovered uh, his uh, unique expertise when it comes to uh, tax and, and, and corporate and other related 
experience that he has when it comes to international activities. He's been a wonderful resource uh, for our nonprofits who are engaged in activities overseas, uh, a fountain of knowledge uh, on these topics, and he's going to be focusing on the, uh, the tax aspects. And we're not talking about U.S. tax exemption. We're talking about other tax aspects of, of uh, nonprofit operations overseas. So I, I know you're going to get a lot out of all three of our speakers. Don't be dismayed by the size of the PowerPoint deck. It's pretty big. Uh, we're obviously going to only be able to, to uh, go through some of the stuff at a very high level, but uh, feel free to, to consult that as an additional resource. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to get us started. Andrew? Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to be here today. I always really look forward to doing these events with, uh, with Jeff and others here at Vanble. It's great to be on this uh, very distinguished panel. And so, as Jeff mentioned, I'm going to talk about trademarks um, and brand strategy and protection. And, you know, first and foremost, a trademark is a brand. Um, so, you know, let's get that out of the way. When I started doing nonprofit trademark work about 10 years ago or so, maybe 12 or 15 years ago, one of the first things I heard from every nonprofit was they didn't have a trademark, they didn't have a brand. And of course, I think most of you in the room appreciate that you do, and it's one of your central assets to protect. Um, what I've tried to do here and through my presentation is present trademark or brand law in a hierarchy. And so we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up to brand value. And that's where every you know, nonprofit or for-profit wants to be, of course, is to have a brand that has value, add some intangible quality or worth to the organization. And so when a brand is identified properly and treated well and trademark law is followed and, and used strategically, you get to that top level of brand value. So we're going to start at the bottom. Um, let's see here. We're going to start at the bottom with what some of you may know a lot about already, which is brand distinctiveness, availability, and exclusivity. Whenever you go to a trademark lawyer with a new brand, they're always going to identify two issues at the front end. One is whether that brand is distinctive enough to be treated as a trademark right away. Sometimes they're not. The other issue is, is that trademark available for use and registration? And then a third issue that you may hear about if you have potential joint ownership of a brand is this issue of exclusivity. So it's best to start on these three uh, foundational points. First, with respect to availability, um, picking a brand for a nonprofit, even if it's not the name of the nonprofit, is much like it is with a for-profit. It's, it's really a bet the company, or in this case, bet the nonprofit moment. Anytime you reach out to your consumer base, if you will, with a new brand, it's an opportunity to either develop goodwill uh, that can become great over time or create an embarrassment if you have to roll out a new brand and, and uh, recoil uh, shortly after launch and, and pull back into something else. So launching that brand, picking that new brand is always a, a bet the nonprofit moment. A couple reasons why. One is in brand law or trademark law, the standard of infringement is pretty easy to meet. It's called likelihood of confusion, and I always tell people it's the polar opposite of beyond a reasonable doubt, that criminal standard that everyone's familiar with. If you do a consumer survey and you get 20% of the people uh, confused between two brands, that in general is enough to establish likelihood of confusion and meet the standard. <clears throat> so if you take that into account, you can see uh, that it's important at the front end to clear a brand, make sure it truly is available and it meets, uh, avoids this likelihood of confusion problem. If you don't avoid it and you have a worst case scenario, um, it's very possible you could find yourself in a dispute. If you get off easy, maybe you change the brand and, and just lose your goodwill. If you don't get off easy, maybe you're in a very expensive litigation that can very easily cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Average cost of a trademark litigation is almost 800000 these days. And that's because trademark disputes are incredibly fact-specific and depend on this likelihood of confusion um, uh, standard. If you do a survey, it's $100,000 minimum just to do a survey to test that point. Um, another issue is the distinctiveness um, uh, uh, of your brand or, or trademark to be. 
and many people have seen this, this hierarchy of distinctiveness that you always hear about, and, and pe many of you probably know that you want to be as high on the, the hierarchy as possible. Um, but for those who don't know, at the very bottom, something that's not protectable as a brand is something that's generic. That's a word like nonprofit or association. The next step up, also not immediately protectable as a brand, is something that immediately tells consumers about what you're doing, the Tennis Industry Association. Where you really want to be with your brands are the top three levels. You want to be suggestive, arbitrary, or fanciful. Pretty easy to explain. Suggestive is something that takes a moment of reflection for consumers to make that connection about what you do. Something that's arbitrary is you open up the dictionary and you find a word that you're going to use out of context. And something that's fanciful is made up. As a practical matter, it's very hard for many organizations to be at that top level. Um, but it is within reach to be at, the, at least at the suggestive level. The only caveat to all that, and this is where we start to get into some of the global issues, is the distinctiveness challenge is more difficult generally outside the U.S. than it is in the U.S. So let's say you meet the U.S. standard of suggestiveness. <clears throat> Many times you will not meet the foreign standard of suggestiveness, and so that creates a brand that is potentially not protectable. So very important slide to keep in mind at the front end uh, when you think about um, picking your potential brand. With respect to exclusivity, we see this trap all the time uh, in the U.S., but also on a global basis where nonprofits come to us and they say, um, you know, we want multiple nonprofits who've come together in this consortium of nonprofits, you know, two or more, to own this brand collectively. And we're all happy with it and uh, we have this little mem memo of understanding, and we think we can all get along. And on, you know, in theory, that all sounds great at the front end, but you know, every relationship, not everyone, but let's say 50% or more end in divorce. It's just a reality of life. And so when the 50% or so of these joint-owned uh, brands ends in its divorce, the issue is where does the brand go? And this is where you get back into that really expensive and troubling side of trademarks where it's incredibly fact-specific and um, it costs a lot of money. We went through this for a client last summer and the cost was easily over 100000 and we got a relatively quick settlement in a few months. So key issues are that a trademark is not divisible and often if you go to court and you've got that joint brand it's either going to end up that nobody owns it or you're going to have to try to deal with this issue. Of course, one of the easiest ways to, to help guard against that situation is to spell out up front what happens when that divorce occurs. You have your prenuptial agreement that spells out if this joint venture, this coalition that we form to, to lobby on certain issues or this uh, joint trade show that we uh, organize together or this joint conference we're going to put on together with a specific name. If the conference to, uh, goes away or one party wants to withdraw or, or the, the parties want to go in different directions, what happens? You spell out that up front in the agreement between the parties, whatever form that agreement takes, a partnership agreement, joint venture agreement, an LLC, operating agreement, whatever the case may be, that's the best way to deal with those issues up front. That's why Jeff and I work well together. He doesn't even realize he just covered the next slide. <laughs> so, uh, it, no, it's terrific. Uh, I love it. So the main, all I could add to what Jeff said is who's going to own the trademark registration as your fallback? Just make sure you own it exclusively, and that helps with the process. So back to the, the, uh, uh, the larger hierarchy that we're talking about here climbing up from distinctiveness, availability, exclusivity, to the next level that many of you are familiar with, which is registration and control. And here the issue is, uh, in, on a global basis, is often that many countries operate on a first-to-file basis. And so you really have to address um, this issue up front and understand that you have to get a trademark application on file before somebody else does so that you preserve that right. In the last 24 hours, I got a panic call from a nonprofit who said, we just entered a, uh, and this broke various rules of trademark law uh, from my point of view strategically. She said, we, we just have a major problem. Uh, we were going to set up a chapter in Europe, and we didn't do any legal agreements. I know you're going to tell me this is horrible, but um, we then decided it's premature to set up this, the chapter, and we've told our folks on the ground there, the potential leaders, that we're not going to do it. So the leaders said, well, we're going to do it anyway. 
And of course, they'd filed their trademark application because they were savvy, and it was inexpensive, and now they have something to, uh, that creates great leverage. So first to file is really a big problem. Andrew, uh, do you want to take a minute just to contrast that to uh, U.S. Uh, Trademark law and specifically yeah. common law rights? Excellent point. So in the United States and some other countries, you can have trademark rights uh, based on what are called common law rights. That's use of a trademark without a registration. Those rights are meaningful, but not nearly as meaningful as a registration, even in a country like the U.S. And the reason is because it's incredibly difficult to prove that you have those rights from a certain date countrywide. And so that's the very costly and unpredictable exercise you have to go through. Whereas you have your registration, it's countrywide rights from the date that you file, uh, critical. So um, there are some nonprofit nuances that I'll just go through very briefly here um, with respect to registration. And, and one of them I've touched on already, which, in foreign, which is this. In foreign countries, it's, it's harder to meet this standard of distinctiveness. And so um, in addition to that, uh, what we see a lot of with, with nonprofits are uh, you know, credentialing services that are sometimes misconstrued as certification services, and so that's a real critical distinction that you want to make in registration practice. <clears throat> Don't treat it as a certification mark if it's really just a standard ser uh, service mark for credentialing services. And also the modern goods and services. You know, um, we're in a new world. You know, many nonprofits will have downloadable apps. They'll have social media services sometimes and downloadable content. All of this is classified differently, something that's more important in foreign countries than the U uh, U.S. oftentimes. Please. So with regard to foreign filings and, and the, uh, uh, with the other uh, foreign agencies, Yeah, so the question is, uh, would a foreign trademark office take into account that one party owns prior rights maybe that, that may be well known in another part of the world, but there's been another party that filed first, and will the trademark office take that into account? Right. And the answer is they won't take it into account unilaterally, and they may take it into account, but not always at the opposition phase. So if you identify that that, app that application is published for opposition and you oppose it, then you may, depending on the country, have an opportunity to uh, make a case for your, how well-known your brand is, but it really has to be well-known, and, and not even just by U.S. standards oftentimes. So the only way that you're really going to rely on that is if you have a famous brand, and there are famous nonprofit brands. Uh, but this, again, is one of those very expensive pitfalls of nonprofit trademark law that you can avoid if you just file for $1,000 or a couple thousand dollars on the front end. Um, so the, and I'll, I need to keep moving, so I'll skip through a couple of these slides. When we talk about chapters and affiliates, I think I've already touched on that with the recent problem. Um, but it's a problem that literally comes up every couple months. I get a nonprofit calling saying, you know, hey, in Russia, our chapter got the trademark registration, and now they're trying to keep us out of the country. So this is a major problem. You can guarantee you're going to put 50, 100,000 into it very easily in one country just to deal with a problem like that. Um, so again, make sure it's documented, as Jeff said, in charter agreements and bylaws. Who owns the brand? Um, another issue that's that's big in the U.S. and and a number of foreign countries is licensing. And so when you let an, another party use your brand, you have to make sure that you've documented properly who owns that brand and who is administering the control over the use of that brand. And there are two aspects to it. It's kind of like the registration process. If you want your presumption, then put it in writing. If you want to prove fully that you've really done everything you need to do, um, then uh, actually you know, walk the walk and control use of the trademarks by the, the parties that are using them. Really, you need to do both. Um, but to get that written license agreement in place will help avoid a lot of problems at the front end. So a couple steps to licensing. Um, treat marks or brands that are used by your chapters and members as a, a certain type of mark called a collective membership mark. Kind of go on record in, in your internal documents, your policies, that this is what it is. Apply to register it in this manner. And so that avoids the whole licensing scenario for that, that class of parties. Um, reflect in your policies that this is a license. 
um, and then enforce everything as well. So as we climb toward the top, I'm now going to race through a number of, of slides here by design. And this gets a little bit of a step beyond the typical trademark law um, uh, information that you hear from lawyers. And, and this is basically taking everything on the lower steps and understanding why we care about this process and moving it as high as possible, uh, moving that brand as high as possible on this hierarchy, creating brand strength and therefore creating brand value. So there are some studies uh, out every year. There's a study by an organization called Interbrand. There are other uh, competitive um, uh, services, but this one since 1974 has been uh, evaluating the top four profit brands, and I imagine they'll do it at some point for nonprofits based on brand strength, again, as a component of brand value. And so as we look through um, this issue, is, I, I love this quote, and I've kind of stuck it in the middle here, that having a strong brand establishes a kind of parity between a nonprofit and the companies they want to influence. And I think that's so true. If you really think about where you're trying to get your money, how you're trying to appeal to the marketplace, treat your nonprofit brand like a for-profit brand, um, and it wins every time as, as a strategy. So with that in mind, let's look at maybe the most challenging type of for-profit brands, since this entity is not studying nonprofit brands yet. And let's see what some business-to-business -business, uh, brands have done to be effective and create brand value. So this is a couple of very quick case studies. So if we look at IBM, look at how their brand has evolved as a logo over time. Look at that visual change. You know, incremental, not dramatic, but look at the other things they start to do. So in 2008, the, co the economy starts to get bad. They're having problems. And so they come up with this Smarter pl uh, Planet uh, uh, slogan, and they have a corresponding logo. So now you've got, you know, you've got the IBM brand, but you're really kind of warming it up for your consumer base. Look at what this did to brand value. And again, brand value is not just a reflection of theoretical brand strength, but also reflects actual growth in the business. So look at just how dramatically that change affected the uh, va overall value of the company. Look again at a case study for UPS. Again, kind of a subtle change to the logo, evolving the logo over time, keeping some of their core elements and name. Um, but uh, then they, all of a sudden in 2003, when they kind of update the logo from the old-fashioned package design to make it more modern, they then, very importantly in 2011, add this phrase, we love logistics. And they do it very effectively so that when you look at the website, it revolves from one lang language to the next. Again, warming up the brand to make it more accessible. What did it do to brand value? The brand value went up. So let's look at the top 100 nonprofit, uh, top 100 for-profit brands, and let's think about what elements they have in common that may be instructive to apply in the nonprofit context. I think you can tell visually from this um, array that there's a lot of color going on and other things, but here are the common elements. Um, acronyms are increasingly popular. Well, that's great news in the nonprofit sense because you know, acronyms have been around a long time in the nonprofit world, but 30% of the top 25 brands have acronyms. But there are, here's how they take it another step. They have other differentiating elements. They have stylization or design that's unique and available, um, and the majority of them use color. So, um, and then uh, I guess finally they, they are very consistent and clear in the way they use the brands, and then they turn to social media as well. So those are lessons that can be applied, I think, very easily in the nonprofit world. Uh, look at this example. One of our clients uh, moved from a very, you know, from an acronym, and certainly acronyms are popular, but a somewhat cumbersome acronym um, that I'm afraid often to pronounce, even though I've pronounced it a hundred times. <laughs> Jeff's going to do it for me. And uh, and so, but look what they did, and and they did this a few years ago, and. I've got to say, they were one of the first nonprofits that I saw make this dramatic shift. And they took a risk, but they found that their business, uh, if you will, has really taken off since they moved to leading age, really uh, from just a, a pedestrian acronym to a, a very effective brand. So you've arrived then, if you climb this ladder, uh, from distinctiveness, availability, exclusivity, up to registration and control, 
through brand strength, then that takes you to brand value and success uh, as a nonprofit. So some legal action items, you know, you've got a value, brand value, understand what it means, act like a top for-profit brand, uh, control your chapters and affiliates, avoid what's called naked licensing. That's the concept I explained earlier where you don't control use by others. Um, apply to register your key trademarks and key countries for your key goods and services. Avoid this joint ownership problem and pick distinctive uh, brands and clear them at the front end. Another quote that I love here, it says, our brand is the single greatest asset that our network has and it's what keep, keeps everyone together. Uh, that's a fairly recent quote from the World Wildlife Fund, and I think that it's another way to help see that brand value can be external but also internal. Two slides maybe on Venable in the global sense. Unusual in this way, so we have a, a, a significant trademark practice at Venable that does a lot of work, of course, in the for-profit and nonprofit sectors. But one thing that's unique about Venable's trademark practice as a top uh, or among top 100 uh, law firms in the United States is that we have no offices in foreign countries. And what that means is we can pick and choose foreign associates, as we call them, or local counsel around the world based on quality and efficiency, cost effectiveness. Um, so that's a key distinguishing factor. Um, we have close relationships with a lot of law firms, some that may look familiar, some that don't, um, but always seeking to find the greatest uh, results at the lowest cost. Thank you, Andrew. Does anyone have any um, questions for Andrew, either here or on the, uh, on the webinar? No questions? Quiet group today. Okay. Well, if you have questions for Andrew later, oh, sorry, over here. Yeah. Oh yeah, China is one of the most notorious first to file countries. So in fact, even if let's say the China, let's say the US and the EU are your most important markets and you say <clears throat> China is of minor importance, in the trademark sense it would be of major importance. And remember, it's not just your organization's name and your organization's logo, which of course are oftentimes separate registrations, but it's other things. It's names of your conferences. Um, for our client, uh, Project Management Institute, we registered their certification mark in how many countries now? Uh, tens of countries and, and uh, um, yeah, and multiple uh, credentialing marks. Yeah, um, yeah, so it's your, your certification and credentialing marks and it's other things like that. Uh, and it's critically important if you believe that you are going to be uh, doing business overseas, whether your, your nonprofit itself is going to open offices or hold meetings, you're going to license your, your marks to uh, affiliates uh, that are being created in various countries, you want to make sure that intellectual property, that trademark is one of your most valuable assets that identifies your brand. Um, and there's, there's no substitute for protecting that and registering it overseas. It can be expensive. It is expensive. It's not cheap. Um, I mean, I think, frankly, that uh, it, it is fairly cost effective compared to, say, a lot of the legal work that we do for nonprofits, but it's still not cheap, but it's a, it's a critically important part of uh, it's an investment that you have to make if you want to be successful and protect your marks overseas. Yep. If you, if you Yeah, that's kind of one of the pitfalls of registration. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, if you register, let's say, a logo that consists of an acronym and a full name and maybe a slogan in it, and that logo changes over time, are you still protected through the registration that you have for the composite? Or use the name or the logo separately. Yeah, and so the, and then the further question was, if you only use the logo, uh, or the, excuse me, the name, uh, or the acronym separately, let's say you break it up into parts and use it in that manner, are you protected? And the answer is no, not th through the registration. Ultimately, in the U.S., um, you know, yeah, it's a lot more cost effective maybe to get one registration, but when you come up to the deadline to maintain the registration or renew it and you have to show use, the standard uh, at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is a material alteration of the mark, and so you have to show 
Uh, you either have to be able to amend the mark by maybe dropping a name or slogan, that's often a material change, or you have to be able to kind of get through the trademark office with a, with a specimen of use, as we call it, or an example of use that looks very similar, uh, you know, almost identical to the trademark that's registered. And oftentimes if you've changed your, you know, removed your name or a slogan or a design from it, you've, you've significantly changed it. So that's why we always recommend uh, registering the component parts of any logo separately. Yeah, one more question, and we need. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. We need to move on in the back of the room. Yeah. I have a question about registering modern goods and services. Uh, specifically, for example, downloadable content. Um, what is the process for that? Like, is it just how do you register downloadable content? What is that? What are you registering? Yeah. So you are registering your brand in connection with downloadable content as opposed to a book. So it's, it's a matter of how it's classified and, and, uh, and covered by the trademark offices around the world. So historically, if you're a nonprofit, maybe you're in classes 35 for your promotional services of a cause and maybe 16, which is for printed matter. So all of a sudden with downloadable matter, uh, downloadable content such as a downloadable newsletter, you're in class 9. And so that really necessitates a new filing if you think about the fact that for many nonprofits, the Class 16 goods are becoming obsolete. And, and this is a really critical point. Whenever um, Andrew and I start working with a, a new client or even a prospective nonprofit client and we're doing some kind of a, Andrew's great at doing kind of a trademark audit of the organization and looking at their key marks and how they're used, particularly on their websites, and then looking at whatever registrations they have or don't have, there has never been one of those that we've done in the decade plus that we've been working together where it hasn't found material deficiencies, oftentimes shocking things for, we're talking massive $500 million budget organizations that don't even have their their own, they have the logo registered, but not their actual name of the organization, or real basic things like that. And then, of course, a lot more complex things that we often find, uh, the, you know, the wrong classes uh, being registered and not being protected and things like that. So it's, there's really a lot of nuances to this, both in the U.S. and overseas. And Jeff, let me add just 10 seconds to that, which is once we do these audits, sometimes people get excited about the audits, and then they say, well, you know, I've got a more pressing problem to address, or, you know, this is, seems like kind of more like insurance, so we're going to put this off for the future. So every month I get a call, just got one a couple of days ago, that says, remember that audit we did a year ago? Well, we've got this major trademark problem. If we had a registration, you know, we, again, could save literally tens of thousands of dollars. Instead, we're trying to piece together a story as to how the client may have trademark rights. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Lindsay? Okay. So Andrew was just discussing it with everyone, brand control. And my topic is one where you don't want your brand associated, and that is anti-corruption overseas. As Woody Allen once said, there are three types of people in the world. There are those who make things happen. There are those who watch things happen. And then there are those who simply wonder what happened. You don't want to be in that last category when it comes to anti-corruption. So let's dig in. We're going to talk about the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It was a law that was established in 1977 and it was sort of at the forefront, certainly globally. And in many respects, many other countries would say, you know, it's the, it's the U.S. long arm and heavy hand reaching outside of its borders. Um, things have certainly caught up since then and we'll, we'll discuss that a bit. But for our law that's been around and on the books for, for all these years, there are two provisions. There's the anti-bribery provision, which is governed by the Department of Justice, and then there's the books and records provision, which is governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the Securities and Exchange Commission governs those entities that are listed on the public exchange, public entities, and the like. We're going to focus today on the anti-bribery provisions. Okay, so just very basically, what does it prohibit? Prohibits paying or offering or even promising to pay or authorizing to pay something of value. Most people think it's simply money, but it goes beyond that. So it's money or anything of value that is performed directly or indirectly. So bear that in mind, the indirectly, we're going to talk about that, with corrupt intent. The with corrupt intent has uh, really been written out of enforcement, just to be frank. So you want to focus on the payment or offering to pay money or anything of value 
with corrupt intent, to a foreign government official or political party. Okay, so the U.S. law is, is slightly nuanced versus other countries' laws in that we have focused, our laws have focused on payment to a foreign government official, that foreign bribery. And it, when it is done for the purpose of influencing the official to act or causing the official to fail to undertake some action. So it's both an affirmative action as well as, as an omission. And it's done in order to obtain an improper business advantage. And again, each of these terms is, is, is interpreted rather broadly. In the U.S., we do have a couple of limited exceptions and an affirmative uh, defenses available, but when we talk through the issues, you'll realize that you don't want to be in a position to have to rely on those. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, yes, a government official is very broadly defined, and when you think about government official, it's not only the minister of education, but it also works its way down to the person on the front line. It also is defined to include parastatal, uh, political party appointees, really anyone with a, a, an official role that has an affiliation with a governmental entity. So very broadly defined. Okay, so what you want to think about is your code of conduct. So looking at your entity and your organization, what do you have as your code of conduct? Do you have something where your employees are to avoid even the appearance of impropriety? That's an important aspect. Um, you basically want to have the, you know, thou shalt not give a big bag of money to the Minister of Education, but you also want to have it stated such that your employees understand it's not just that. And it's, it's in the gray zone where most organizations g get into trouble. Um, you can't have anything paid to an external party, the foreign official we mentioned, but also subcontractors, sponsors, vendors, other business associates. Think about that. Think about an extension of your organization. Are you working with on a joint venture basis? Are you contracting with someone who is acting eff effectively on your behalf? Um, so as I said before, it's a bit more nuanced than, than simply you know, the direct payment to the official. That's certainly included, but it's not limited to that. And then the improperly obtaining or, re or retaining business. Well, some folks in the room may say, well, we're, we're not a for-profit organization, so you know, I, can just, I can snooze through the rest of this procedure. But the reality is that that term is also very broadly interpreted. So if, it's, if your activity is furthering your charter, that's the equivalent of doing something to, to uh, undertake to, to increase your business to obtain or retain your business. So think of business as what's your, what's your organization's charter, and is it forwarding that charter, that mission? Then that's comparable to, uh, to business in this context. And it's for obtaining favorable treatment. So you're looking for a grant, you're looking for an in to provide uh, services to a particular entity or organization overseas. That's, again, favoring your organization. So don't think about it in a pure business for-profit business context. Okay, so the accurate books and records provision, that one, it's, um, what's interesting about that, and I'll, I'll talk about it just in the, in the for-profit context, but essentially if you had a provision in your books and you said I, the organization is going to spend $100,000 to, um, to, to provide this agent for business on our behalf, and we're going to add another $25,000 for that agent to bribe the Minister of Education. Okay. Would any organization ever do that? No. However, if they had written it that way, it would not violate the books and records provision because you would be accurately reflecting your payment. That said, I have yet to see it. So, so what, you want, what you want to have is, is that concept. Obviously, Accurate book, books and records is, is important, whether you're for-profit or not-for-profit. So you want to make sure that the, the, the payments and the designations that are made do accurately reflect the payments, the amount, the recipient, etc. Okay, so think about your code of conduct. Um, in order to comply with the FCPA, you should think about tracking, vetting, and monitoring various payments. And in your world, those Typically, the ones on the edge tend to be promotional accounts, um, charitable giving, 
entertainment expenses, and then payments to any facilitator, middleman, agent, co-venture partner, and the like. That's where we see the gray zone, and that's where, where organizations can get into trouble. Okay, so who is subject to the FCPA? This is domestic concern, so any organization that has been formed in the United States. It also includes U.S. persons wherever located, so if, if you're a U.S. citizen, U.S. person, um, as well as most non-U.S. subsidiaries of U.S. companies, so overseas organizations. If the direction is coming from the U.S. headquarters, then the government, DOJ, is very interested in, in expanding its, uh, its welcome mat to include the non-U.S. entities as well. And we'll talk about a couple of the cases, and you'll see where the U.S. entity, the U.S. entity is typically the first target, but the second target follows on the, uh, the non-U.S. sub or affiliated entity. Okay, uh, one concept that's important to understand is respondeat superior. And this is where we talked about before the directly or indirectly. So just because you sit and you say, well, our organization didn't do it, if in fact your co-venture partner did or if an agent did, you're, they're acting on your behalf. They're acting as your agent and you're the principal. So this concept of directly or indirectly certainly catches organizations under the FCPA. And I uh, have an example there, BAE made some unlawful payments to some market advisors to facilitate some sales. And in fact, the government said that, that BAE failed to properly supervise them. They had control over these, these persons and, and entities and they failed to, uh, to govern them. They ended up paying $400 million in uh, U.S. dollars and uh, 30 million pounds in penalties. So very significant penalties here. So understanding territorial jurisdiction, again, the U.S. is thinking about the long arm and the heavy hand. It's very easy to have jurisdiction attached for purposes of anti-corruption under the uh, FCPA. F effectively, any contact with the U.S. that facilitates the payment or the scheme. So it can be by emails coming through an AOL account. This is, we can't make this up. This actually happened. Uh, it can be telephone calls that have occurred either start or finish in involving the U.S. It can be use of U.S. dollar accounts uh, to transmit funds. All of those will satisfy uh, jurisdiction. So we talked about this before. What are the elements? Just a review. Anything of value, directly or indirectly, paid to a foreign official to obtain or retain business. So the devil's in the details. Think about the areas that we talked about. Promotional accounts. So that's one where you're providing something uh, of benefit. You want to maybe introduce your products to the Minister of Education so that they have a better awareness. Well, you need to be careful when you do that. Um, charitable giving. There's another advisory opinion where the, the gifting to the main target's favored charity was deemed a problem because then the minister... Uh, adopted that, that uh, offer and took on the business that the company was promoting. So again, just that connection. Um, entertainment expenses, lavish dinners and the like, certainly if you're having somebody come over, let's say you want the Minister of Education to come over and get a better understanding as to what you do, what your organization's about, that's fine. Just don't fly them through Vegas or don't pay for you know, the spouse and children. Um, anything on the, on the edge there certainly is problematic. Yes, question? Right, so the question was if there's an overseas conference and uh, you want the, an official to come in and speak on, on the particular matter and they inquire with whether or not there's an honorarium. Um, you have to look carefully on that. If you're bringing them in purely to come in and speak and if it's going to cover reasonable expenses, if it's an international flight, probably business class is okay. If you're going to put them up at the location of the conference, for a reasonable amount of time, if it's a two-day conference, probably for the you know the two nights prior. Um, but you you want to you want to be careful. You want to have control over that rather than just simply giving the honorarium and having them make the arrangements. It's better for the organization to make the arrangements so that you can march that.
fine, careful line. But that's that's an excellent question. Yes, another question. So I, I know it's a completely different context because most of the people in the room are familiar with it. How does this compare, for example, to the gift laws with regard to interactions with Congress and congressional staff and, 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 and with the, uh, agency officials? I mean, there's also... Yeah, that, that's actually not... 100% my area of, of expertise. We do have a colleague, um, actually several colleagues, Dizel Carey among others, who's spoken on that. And they're very similar. So they're, they're very similar. There are nuances, though, so you have to be careful. So if, in fact, you're faced with a, with a situation on gift giving under the U.S. laws uh, for purposes of either lobbying uh, and the like versus the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, if you think about it, it's a slightly different scenario. So here we're discussing payments to foreign government officials. Um, many of the concepts are, are, are very similar, but you'd want to be careful before you make the gift to make sure that what you're doing on the lobbying legislative side is consistent so, I mean, with those laws. That's correct. So the cup of coffee is probably okay. Most, um, most organizations have thresholds, government officials, 20 or $25 limits. So you, you do need to be careful in that sense. It, generally, it's a very low threshold. You know, cup of cup of Starbucks puts up four bucks a day for a cup of coffee now. Um, but if you're going to bring very expensive bottles of wine in for dinner, have a very lavish dinner, you, you need to justify that. You need to justify that because in many many instances, just the appearance of impropriety would apply. So in both contexts, whether you're talking foreign government officials or U.S. government officials. Okay, <clears throat> uh, willful blindness is another concept, and I'll just explain it. That you can't you can't stick your head in the sands and 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 ignore what's going on. So it's a, it's really a known or should have known concept. We're going to talk a little bit about red flags before, but you can't um, just turn a blind eye or ignore what, what you hear is going on. If there's a red flag, then you have an obligation to review it and investigate. If you conclude at the end of the day that there's not an issue, that's fine. But simply ignoring a, a red flag and then if an issue later arises, you'll certainly be in, in trouble. Okay, affirmative defenses and exceptions, we talked about that. Um, one is when the payment is under the written laws of a foreign country. The written law of pick a country says, thou may bribe a foreign government official, then you're scot-free. <laughs> okay, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never seen a law <laughs> that's stated that way. So don't rely on that. There are, there are no such foreign laws. Um, when the payment is reasonable and a bona fide expense, expenditure. So that's what we were talking about before. Is it reasonable <clears throat> to have the honorarium? Thanks. Is it reasonable to have the honorarium paid Certainly if it's, if it's for reasonable business expense, reasonable time frame to reflect the, the business activity. Okay, the facilitation payment exception is one that is written into the U.S. law, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So that's commonly known as the grease payment. You can make a, a, a small payment. The grease payment is not accepted anywhere else. And the anti-corruption statutes of the OECD that was implemented, so the 38 countries that are members of the OECD now have their own country laws on anti-corruption, and no other country permits a facilitation payment. You have to be careful here because um, if you think about the example of I'm going to the passport office, I need to update my passport. I can go the regular course and have it in the, the stack that's this big, or maybe under sequestration this high, three feet high, or I can pay a slight fee to get it expedited, and maybe it's in the three-inch stack rather than the three-foot high stack. So that payment would be considered a grease or facilitation payment. It's, it's a non-discretionary payment. It's to simply move the process ahead without really any, any uh, substantive review or consideration. That would be considered a grease payment. We have had one, one matter overseas where payments were made to get permits, to assist in getting permits to bring in employees. And while it was a low threshold on an individual case, you say, well, it's $5, $10. The problem was the organization was paying for about 1000 a month because they needed to bring in a substantial number of persons to get those permits. 
So they needed 1,000 permits, not just one permit. And the cumulative effect of that basically eviscerated the concept of a facilitation payment. So before you um, jump in and rely on facilitation payments, be, be very careful um, because they're, they're very uh, strictly construed and narrowly applied. So criminal penalties, you've, you've seen the headlines of different cases, uh, civil penalties, Private lawsuits can spring up. There's no FCPA private right of action, but oftentimes civil litigation can ensue. And, and if you're found guilty, many times you will lose the ability to contract with the U.S. government. So big, bad, and scary. Recent trends is enforcement against individuals. What's interesting about Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is that because of these potential huge penalties and if you were convicted, you would lose your government contracting rights. What happened was over the course of the years, there was this, the case law developed by settlement, if you will. Companies were not challenging um, the decisions. And so companies would settle out. They wanted to protect their brand. They didn't, you know, they wanted to do it as quietly as possible. Um, and, and I should make a footnote there. To date, the, the cases have really been focused on the for-profit side but the government tends to follow different trends. So it'll go after one industry. It'll find one company in one industry performing in a manner, and it'll say, hmm, I bet their competitors are doing the same thing. And so if you think about um, lanes that are prolific in dealing with governments, certainly the pharmaceutical industry, the government contracting industry, and dare I say the nonprofit association area when you're going overseas. You've got to get permits. You've got to get approval. So, um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, but the, the other recent trend is that the, we've seen an uptick in enforcement again in, against individuals. So this is really where the marker came down to say the, the law by settlement has, has changed over the last couple of years because when individuals are seeing the risk of potentially going to jail and serving time, they will stand up and say, no, I want to challenge this or that. I want to challenge the government, the, the definition of foreign government official. I want to challenge these various things. So you have seen some courts now reviewing these, uh, these various principles. And you've also seen many individuals, as I have on the screen there, uh, who have actually served time for, for their role in the uh, anti-corruption. Um, just a couple of reviews here for the two, 2012 enforcement actions. 12 corporate FCPA enforcement actions um, alone totaled 260 million. Um, we've had substantial, this is just in one year. So the average fine or penalty was 21.7 million. That's a, that's a big chunk of change. Several cases that were both DOJ and SEC, so both the anti-bribery as well as the books and records provisions that we have listed there. Uh, four were DOJ only, so just the anti-bribery, and three were SEC, just the books and records provisions. But you can see there's substantial companies, large large companies that have, have paid quite, quite a bit. Um, internationally, it's also important to see where the U.S. has been on the front end. We have very, um, the, the government has a, a large um, resource in that it can get information. It can subpoena people, it can, can subpoena records and the like. Other governments don't have that necessarily, so what you see is a lot of Me Too's. I mentioned before that all of the OECD countries have started their own anti-corruption uh, laws and cases, and so they'll see a U.S. one if there's a nexus to their particular country, then you'll see the Me Too case as well, relying on the, the, the data that was mined, if you will, from, from cases in the U.S. So thinking about... Um, what are some of the red flags? What are some things that you should look into further? If the transaction's in a high corrupt uh, risk country, and I'll show you a chart in just a minute, if you've got a representative or an agent requesting an unusually high fee, uh, if you're dealing with, with your, your representatives, it should be on a par with what you see, what the market bears, what others pay, what, what you typically will pay. The entertaining or giving gifts, be careful of that, not only to the government officials, but also their relatives any unusual contract terms or special payments, use of shell companies, foreign customers' insistence that a particular agent be used. If you're dealing with the minister and he says, we're, we'd love to, to work with you, we love your product, we'd love to have you here, but you have to go through Joe Smith in order to do so. The red flag should be firmly at the top of the pole. Um, 
charitable donations and then payments through third countries which, which don't make any commercial sense. So here's the map, colorful. This is, our, this is my one slide of color. <laughs> Andrew had so many colorful things on his slides. This is a heat map. So where you see the, the dark red, that's the warning sign is going off. The cooler areas are those that are, that are less high in the terms of potential risk. And this is from Trans Transparency International, an organization that tracks um, anti-bribery and, and corruption in ranked countries. So a lot, of, a lot of associations are interested in going into particular jurisdictions. I know from my work um, with Jeff and, and the rest of the team, China is always a big interest. Indonesia can be an interest. India, uh, Singapore, for example, Mexico. So if we look at it, Singapore is pretty high. I mean, you have New Zealand ranked at number one, so that's the least corrupt. In, in terms of this review. So Singapore is number five. The U.S. is 24. We're not that, you know, we're okay. We're, we're still within the yellow band, but as one of our colleagues says, it, that's usually New Jersey who gets us there. <laughs> and then going over, you see China at 75. You've got um, India at 95, Mexico at 100. So, you know, just think about this map. Where are you doing business? What's the likelihood? Are you in Denmark or are you in Nigeria? Big difference. Okay, you also want to do due diligence on anyone that's involved in your, in your activities overseas. Think about it's not just yourself, it's not your organization, it's not just your employees, but it's your partners, it's your agents, it's your service providers, um, it's, it's anyone with whom you're doing business. Think about that, because that's usually where the risk is. It's not the organization itself, it's the folks on the fringe. So you want to do some due diligence. You want to put in place some contractual provisions when you're dealing with them so that even though they may not be a U.S. person or operating in the U.S., that they understand that your organization is and you're contractually imposing your obligations on them. It gives you the first line of defense. It helps you when the government comes knocking at your door to say, look, we've taken reasonable steps. We've tried to educate. We've tried to train. We've tried to enforce these laws contractually with our, our providers, our, our co-venture partners. Um, if there is a, a red flag, obviously you want to um, investigate it, give some consideration to that, do your due diligence, have counsel um, conduct or direct it so you've got attorney-client privilege so that if at the end of the day you've done your investigation and maybe you found something that happened five years ago you no longer deal with the, with the person or entity, you decide to move forward, you know, you've got the comfort of attorney-client privilege on that, on that particular investigation. Um, and really what you want to do is educate, train, audit, and repeat. It's like, you know, washing your hair, shampoo, rinse, repeat. This is like educate, train, audit, and repeat. You want to monitor, put things in place, put your contractual provisions in place, teach your, your team members, uh, the folks at the front line, those that are going overseas in particular, and then audit. Are they doing what they say they're doing? Talk to your internal audit. Make sure that um, the monies are being paid appropriately to the right folks. Questions? Yeah, actually, it would take uh, one or two quick questions, and then we got to move on to uh, Charles right here. Oh, so the question was, is there a safe harbor if you do the educate, audit, train, repeat? Um, there is an example, the, the uh, Morgan Stanley case that recently came down is probably our closest example, where the DOJ declined to prosecute Morgan Stanley U.S. and instead just focused on the overseas affiliate in Hong Kong for improper payments that were made to secure some land grants in China. And the reason, the basis for that was the government looked and said, you've got a robust compliance program. You've, you've trained your folks. You've pushed out you know, at regular intervals that this is the line that you must tow. So clearly the activities were beyond the scope of what was authorized. So I would use that as an example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Charles? Um, we're going to talk about what for many people is their least favorite subject, which are taxes. And we're going to talk a little bit about how nonprofits can operate overseas, how the foreign countries may tax those operations, how the U.S. may tax those foreign operations. Uh, we'll talk about VAT or sales taxes, uh, employee and independent contractor issues, and then uh, all of the forms that you have to file for the privilege and joy of doing business overseas. 
Um, there are a number of ways in which you can establish foreign operations. You can register a branch office, just like you may have offices in D.C. and New York and in Los Angeles. You can have an office in London or in Brussels or in Sao Paulo or in Beijing. Uh, and there, that's just an extension of the existing U.S. legal entity. Uh, you can set up a wholly owned subsidiary. You can set up a local company, a local um, LLC, or the, the, there are many flavors of foreign entities. You can set up one that the U.S. entity owns 100% of. Uh, you can have local nonprofits that are sort of member-oriented nonprofits, or there may be other forms of local entities. Um, in the case of the branch office, you would actually register to do business just like you would qualify in a different state. You would qualify in the foreign country, file a permit. Uh, that would then potentially trigger a series of tax filing obligations. And the fact that you qualify as a nonprofit in the U.S. by itself doesn't mean that you're going to be a nonprofit outside of the U.S. Uh, you may or may not be, and you may have to file uh, and, and try and qualify under the local laws. Uh, in the case of the foreign subsidiary, you would own 100% of it, and it would again have its own sort of independent filing obligations. Um, the, one of the issues is whether you have a, a standalone entity versus an affiliated entity. So you, you may have a situation where you st establish a wholly owned subsidiary in a foreign country. The U.S. owns 100% of it, and it's there to provide, say, conference support, uh, but it's not actually doing fundraising. Or there may be situations where the nonprofit is a fundraising nonprofit and is actually looking to raise funds in that particular jurisdiction. Um, and this gets into issues of you know, where, where does the money go to? Does the money come from that local jurisdiction back to the U.S. to get funneled elsewhere, or does it go directly from the foreign jurisdiction to the ultimate sort of recipient? Um, and it also gets into issues of whether you have an affiliation agreement between the U.S. entity and the foreign entity, or whether there's just a licensing of the different trademarks and brands that, that Andrew was talking about, and agreements on how the, the local chapter may, may use those. Um, another issue is what sort of functions is the local entity going to perform, and that will have an impact on whether it needs to be a nonprofit organization. Uh, is it going to just put on a conference from time to time? Is it going to have members who pay dues? Or is it going to become a, a fundraising opportunity? And the functions and the activities of the foreign operation will depend upon, will, will determine w what your tax filing requirements are in that particular uh, country. And you, as you do in the U.S., you may have to register both with the tax authorities and with the local governmental nonprofit uh, agency. Now, uh, if the local entity is the branch, of the U.S. nonprofit, then you may have to register both the U.S. officers and the, and the local officers that you may have. Uh, you may have to file financial statements that cover not just the operations in the foreign jurisdiction, but include all of the U.S. financials. Uh, and you may have to do that not in U.S. dollars, but in, you may have to translate this into foreign currencies. You may have to have uh, financial statements under non-U.S. GAAP accounting standards, and that gets to be complicated and expensive. Um, and as I said, you may have to file foreign tax returns similar to the, the U.S. 990. Um, there are also where you have affiliation agreements, what we've seen are there are situations where the, the local government uh, wants to know about how you came up with the cost allocations, what services were actually per performed by the U.S. for the foreign entity, were the fees that were charged reasonable, um, 
and as we'll get to in the VAT area, that they may look at it very carefully from a, are you avoiding VAT issues? Uh, on the U.S. tax side, uh, even, if, even if you're a nonprofit, you still have tax returns to file, information returns to file. To the extent that there are any income and expenses of the foreign branch, you'd have to pick that up on your U.S. tax returns. If it's a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, typically you would not pick up that income and expense uh, until, if it ever happens, there's a cash dividend out of the foreign sub up to the U.S. Uh, that, on, that is true. We should clarify, though, that even though a, like a wholly owned subsidiary or a, su subsidiary or a wholly controlled you know, nonprofit affiliate, even though it's not part of the same legal entity as the U.S. entity, so the revenues and expenses and assets and liabilities don't get rolled up into, the, say, the 990 or financials of the U.S. entity, there are questions now on the Form 990, particularly enhanced questions since the 08 version of the form, that require disclosure of those subsidiaries and affiliates and what sort of control and, and everything else. So you will have to disclose the details about that on the Form 990. That's right. And, and as we'll get to in a little while, there are a number of other forms. The IRS love forms. The, the more forms, the better. So there are, in the international context, there are all sorts of forms, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, so let's talk about VAT and, and general sales tax issues. Uh, many foreign jurisdictions impose very significant VAT or sales tax. They can be 15, 20, 25 percent in, in that sort of range. And to the extent that you're a U.S. nonprofit and you're putting on a conference or a convention in a foreign country, that activity by itself may be such that you have to register for VAT purposes in that foreign country. You may not be considered to be doing enough there to have to register from, a, from an income tax perspective, but you may still have to register from a value-added tax perspective, and typically those are very different agencies separate from, from each other. Um, if you are subject to the VAT, then you need to register and collect. And that's the important part is you need, when, when you uh, set the fees for conference attendees, you know, if, if it's $1,000 for the three-day conference, you then need to collect the, the additional uh, VAT or sales tax on that. You would also pay VAT when you are the buyer of the hotel rooms or the conference rooms or the food or the signs or the advertising and so forth. And then the difference between the VAT that you've collected from the participants and the VAT you've paid gets paid over to the uh, taxing authorities. And so if you're going to put on a large conference, you can have a significant economic impact by not registering for VAT because you may be paying VAT but not collecting it to offset your VAT expense. And in a perfect world, the VAT you collect will equal the VAT you pay uh, so that you're not out of pocket effectively uh, for the VAT on, on the items that you've purchased. Now, um, there are because tax authorities love penalties. Uh, there are always significant penalties for failure to register and collect and pay over VAT. Um, but you know, in, in, as a practical matter, if you are going into a country for the first time and maybe the last time, and it's a small conference, people have been known not to register. On the other hand, where you have an annual conference with 1,000 people, uh, it's highly recommended that you register, uh, if only because of the economic impact of, of, of not doing so. Um, and, and Charles, I, I presume uh, that just because, uh, say someone uh, poses the question to themselves, well, we're a nonprofit, we're a tax-exempt organization here in the U.S., exempt under 501c3, so we must just simply be exempt from paying this VAT or from collecting it. Any, any, any basis to those presumptions? Uh, none of the slightest. Uh, the fact that you may be tax exempt uh, for income tax purposes in the U.S. doesn't mean that you're in any way exempt from GST, VAT, or other sales taxes uh, when you're outside of the U.S. 
So the, the answer to that question should, be, should clearly be no. And of um, course, even here in the U.S., just because you're tax exempt for corporate income tax purposes um, does not have any uh, bearing on your obligation to collect and remit sales tax on sales that are subject to sales tax. For instance, when you're selling books and, uh, and other publications and, and DVDs and other things at your conferences, uh, just because you're a tax exempt organization does not provide any exemption from uh, U.S. Uh, state and local uh, sales tax. Uh, and with respect to the paying of sales tax in the U.S., uh, there certainly are uh, certain state and local exemptions that are available to certain organizations, not all 501c3s, and generally not non-501c3s either, um, but you have to apply for those exemptions and, and to, uh, expressly take advantage of those uh, if you want to avoid paying sales tax on your purchases. So let's talk about people for a moment. Um, generally, if a nonprofit is expanding its global reach, there are people from the U.S. who are going to be going overseas. They may be going over for a few days or for a few weeks or for much longer periods of time. Um, in addition, uh, if you already have an established uh, global sort of network of operations, there may be people from other countries who come back to the U.S. to work and assist in trade shows or conventions and so forth. So, if a U.S. person is paid by the U.S. nonprofit, still subject to the full regular you know, payroll and Social Security taxes that you would collect if they were just as if they were working in the U.S. Uh, in addition, depending upon how much time somebody spends in the foreign country, they may now become subject to tax in that foreign jurisdiction. Um, and they may become subject to local country Social Security taxes. Now, there are, uh, with respect to certain countries, a uh, fairly large number, uh, mainly uh, the higher tax countries, there are income tax treaties between the U.S. and the U.K. and Germany and France and China and so forth that say if you're not there for more than 183 days, you're probably not subject to the local country tax. But there are any number of countries that the U.S. does not have an income tax treaty with and their local rules may be quite different. So if you are having somebody from your U.S. operations work overseas, you need to think about what their local tax impact may be for that employee other, over there. Um, in addition, on the Social Security side, there are e very few totalization agreements as they're referred to. So you can end up in a number of situations where an employee gets paid off of U.S. payroll is subject to U.S. Social Security taxes and is still subject to local country Social Security taxes because there's no totalization agreement. And that ends up being a sort of double tax for the uh, U.S. employee. Now, to the extent that the, the employee does pay taxes to a foreign country, there's an attempt to avoid a double tax by giving them a foreign tax credit against their U.S. tax liability for the foreign taxes they pay. And uh, in some situations, there's an exemption under Section 911, but that means you have to have been overseas for a full year and uh, satisfy some other tests, and most people working for a nonprofit wouldn't be there that long. Um, if the U.S. employee is paid by the local entity, now your subject, you know, your U.K. affiliate now the UK affiliate is the withholding agent and has to withhold UK pay as you go taxes, UK Social Security and all of that. Um, you can claim a credit for, again, the UK taxes against your US income, but you can't claim a credit for the foreign Social Security taxes against your US Social Security tax, so you still end up with a sort of double uh, taxation. Uh, let's talk a little bit about compliance issues. Um, as I said, the IRS love forms. Uh, the more forms, the better. And so to the extent that you do have operations outside of the U.S., uh, the IRS wants to know about it. Um, and those requirements apply equally to nonprofits, not just to uh, just-for-profit entities. And as you have seen from reading the newspapers, uh, the IRS and Congress is extremely concerned about uh, reporting of offshore bank accounts, offshore investments, 
Um, we have a number of nonprofits where they have cash that gets invested and they invest in offshore financial institutions, offshore stocks, and a variety of investments, many of which may have to be uh, reported. Uh, the main form that you have to worry about is the FBAR form, the Foreign Bank Account Report, this 90-22.1. If any of you happen to have a foreign operation and you are the signer of checks on that foreign bank account, you have to file this FBAR form by June 30th of each year. It's a Treasury Department form. Uh, they get very unhappy if you don't sign it and send it in. And you have to do it even if you don't have a financial interest. So it's not your money. You don't get to take it home. Uh, but you have sign-in authority. You still have to file it. Um, in addition, to the extent that you have foreign subsidiaries, if you own more than 50% of that foreign subsidiary, you're deemed to have a financial interest in any bank accounts of that foreign entity, and you have to report those. And there's a penalty of $10,000 for each unreported account with a six-year statute of limitations. So if you have operations in 20 countries and you've got 20 foreign bank accounts and you haven't filed the FBAR forms, that can get to be really expensive. Um, there's the Form 5471 and the Form 926. You file those if you set up a foreign entity where you actually own at least 10% of the stock. Uh, and that may happen if you either have an actual foreign subsidiary that is a local nonprofit, or if you have a passive investment in an offshore private equity fund or hedge fund or other form of investment portfolio. Um, for individuals who uh, there's now this new form 8938, uh, as I said, the Irish love forms, and if one form is good, two forms for the same thing are better. So you've got this new form that became applicable in 2011. It applies to individuals only for the moment until there are regs that say otherwise. But again, to the extent that anybody sitting in this room or listening over the Internet have signatory authority over a foreign bank account, they have to report it on the 8938 as well. Um, and then there are also these forms, the 8865 and the 8621, where you have investments in foreign partnerships or in what they call PFIX. Uh, so th those are the sort of highlights of what you have to worry about when you have people going overseas. Thank you, Charles. Uh, questions for Charles? Okay, uh, two questions. Difference between a wholly owned subsidiary and a licensee. Typically, the licensee would be an unrelated party. Uh, you, you would still want to have a license agreement between the U.S. nonprofit and any of its foreign chapters, subsidiaries, partially owned joint ventures, and anybody that uses your brand, you want a license agreement. But uh, typically, when you talk about a, a, a licensee, you're thinking of an unrelated party in the subsidiary, thinking about an entity that you actually own, have the stock of, or hold the membership interests of. Um, and then, what was the second question? Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, wh wh why not set up a foreign subsidiary rather than a local chapter because it may be easier to control it? Um, and that really becomes an issue of how you want to conduct your activities. If you have a wholly owned foreign subsidiary, that may require that you appoint a board. Uh, it may require that you have people. Uh, there may not be enough people on the U.S. operations who actually want to be on the local boards. 
Um, being on a board of directors of a foreign company can have legal consequences that they may not be willing to take on, uh, particularly where they're sitting here in the U.S. and the actual day-to-day business operations are in, in China or someplace, and they may not feel that they have a level of control over what's going on, whereas if you have a local chapter uh, managed by the local members, those people have, are, are closer to the, to the situation, have a better idea perhaps of what's going on. And Lindsay, if you could comment. Yeah, I would just add on that, um, not from the tax perspective, but just on general control issues. It depends on what your goals are overseas and how much it's sort of the risk reward, how much involvement and control you actually want versus how much you're willing to allow others to do it. So, you know, the if you want to establish an entity overseas, clearly you've got greater control. If you're working more at a arm's length basis, you have less control, but you have less risk as well. So there's sort of that risk reward. And you really have to think from a strategy standpoint, what's your goal in that country? Oftentimes it's a sliding scale. So when you're first looking to enter into a particular country, you may just put your toe in and you may just start working with somebody who's already established there. You're, you're seeing what their activities are, what their business reputation is, how you get along. You may then progress down the scale, do a venture, and then you may actually form your own entity there. So oftentimes it's sort of a sliding scale that we see. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, even beyond that, the answers to those questions are going to vary country by country, dictated by local law, because sometimes you're forced to form a for-profit entity or a non-profit entity, or however they're, however they're defined under, uh, under local laws if you want to form a separate entity. Um, Lindsay and, and her group uh, have worked with many of our nonprofits in this exercise. Uh, they've even developed this wonderful chart that kind of lays out all of the different options of kind of in general from a 30,000-foot level, different ways that you can start doing business overseas in different countries and the pros and cons. Of, of different options, but you really need to make that assessment on a case-by-case basis and a country-by-country basis. And for those of you who are interested in this topic, we did a um, one of our monthly seminars on this what, about a year ago maybe. Um, it's on our list of all of our recorded seminars. It was about international operations of, of nonprofits. Uh, if you want to go on our website, you can listen to that and you can find a lot more information about this topic. Um, any other questions for any of our panelists? Here, uh, someone just asked for a copy of that chart. <laughs> uh, yes, Barbara, we will get that to you. Uh, all right, I want to thank uh, our panelists today for, uh, for a terrific program. Thank you all for attending, and uh, we hope to see you back here next month. Thank you.